Welcome to Intro Psychology Unit 8. In this unit, we're going to be talking about all things cognition. That's going to include language, intelligence, and problem solving. So let's get to it. The first thing we're going to talk about in cognition is what is a cognition? What is an idea? Well, broadly defined, an idea is a concept. Concepts can be anything that we can conceptualize. I know it's hard to define something with its own definition, but if you think back to unit seven, when we defined schemes, schemas, and schematas, those were categories of concepts or categories of ideas. So the schemas could be the, the category and the things that are in those categories are the concepts or the ideas. So we have a schema for vehicles and the different components are the different concepts or ideas or a schema for colors or a schema for types of animals and all the individual animals and all the individual colors would be the concepts. So just keep that in mind when we're thinking about other things. In addition, concepts can be abstract like justice, friendship, fairness. Although we might be able to find some clip art that could approximate that, they may be harder for us to illustrate. Now, when we think about these concepts or ideas, it's important when we move forward and we think about the realm of problem solving. What is problem solving? Well, let's first define problems. When we think about a cognitive problem, this is a cognitive task that requires our concentration, our explicit consciousness, and also involves a lot of working memory. Now keep in mind, if you are just tuning into this lecture and it's the first intro psych lecture you've tuned into, you may want to follow up by watching unit five on consciousness and unit seven on memory to help bring you up to speed on that. So problems are these cognitive tasks that are a little bit more onerous than just everyday concepts and ideas. And there's many different types of problems. We're not going to show an exhaustive list, but I do want to present you with a couple categories or examples of problems that can be counted as a cognitive problem. The first is analogies. So what is an analogy? Well, this is a logical problem. This is something where you have to compare relationships and understand how two components are connected. If you think about our schematic maps, this is the idea of trying to understand what makes you link these things in your brain. Sometimes we do this so automatically, we don't really consider the relationship. And sometimes it's a bit more implicit than we realized. So making these things a little bit more explicit and then learning how to generalize them to other types of schematic maps is really important. So you also have to understand context. An example of this, a tree is to a park as a fish is to blank. You have to understand what the relationship between a tree and a park is, what is a park, and you have to understand where fish belong. So you need a little bit of semantic knowledge. Think back to memory unit, we talked about semantic knowledge and understanding trivial stuff. You also have to have that analytical side. And so you may have answered this with ocean or lake or pond. Those could all be acceptable. This one, perhaps a little bit more tricky. A French fry is to potato as a pizza is to blank. Well, a French fry is a highly processed potato. Uh, a pizza, there's a lot more ingredients in a pizza than there is in a French fry. So perhaps we have multiple correct answers. Perhaps we're thinking of the tomato sauce. So we want to say a pizza is to tomato. Or we're thinking about the wheat in the crust. Or we're thinking about different herbs and spices or different toppings or even the cheese itself. Or perhaps you want to be more generalist with it and say something like a french fry is to potato as a pizza is to a garden, perhaps. So that's an analogy. Then we have anagrams. Anagrams require a lot of working memory because you have to rearrange things and hold them in place in your mind's eye, in your consciousness. So you have to rearrange these stimuli and produce something new. Although I really like analogies, I personally struggle with anagrams. However, I did create the four anagrams on this page, so try and pause the video now and figure out what the anagrams are. Have you paused? All right, so the first one, uh, I, I made these up, so I'll tell you the answers. The first one is painting. The second one is cell phone. The third one, light bulb. And the fourth one is stairway. Yes, I was sitting in my home at the base of a stairway uh, looking at a painting and looking at my cell phone when I made up those questions. So those might have been easy for you. They might have been hard for you. If you like games like Boggle or Bananagrams, this may be something that's more up your alley. 
Another type of problem that we can solve is sequences. This is less language-based and usually much more mathematically based. This is understanding patterns or functions in a sequence. And we can do basic sequences like skip counting, if I'm going to skip count by threes, three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, and so on and so forth. We can skip count things that we place a number value on if I skip count the different months of the year. But then we can do other types of functions. We can do squares or we could do cubes of numbers. And sequences can actually involve two different functions at once. So you see here on the fourth line, 2, 100, 4, 90, 8, 80, 16, 70, may not be readily available to you, but if you split the sequence into two separate functions that alternate, you might be able to detect what would come next. So if we just look at every second number, every odd number now, um, it is 2, 4, 8, 16. So we see a doubling function. And then if we look at the other numbers, we have 10, 90, 80, 70, we see a reduction by 10 function. So that can help us predict what comes next. And what is next in the sequence is 32 followed by 60. So sequences can be easier, they can be harder. And this is another type of problem. In order to do this, you really have to understand the mathematical pattern of it. And there are way more complicated problems out there too that cannot be capitalized as one function or two. You might be looking for different combinations or different steps. And this is the idea you have to figure out not the sequences in numbers, but the sequences in actions one must take to be successful. And this is the idea you have to combine different possibilities and compare different possible outcomes. Let's give an example. This is a pretty famous example. In this river example, you have a farmer who needs to take their fox, their sheep, and their lettuce patch across a river. But they have a boat that only holds two things, the farmer and one other item. And you can't leave the sheep and the lettuce alone on a riverbank because the sheep will eat the lettuce. And you can't leave the fox and the sheep alone because the fox will eat the sheep. So you can leave the fox and the lettuce alone, but that may not be enough to help you figure out how to get across the river. You have to think about a series of steps. Would you be able to solve this? What would be the steps you take? Feel free to pause the video right now because I will tell you the answer. Did you pause? Okay, so here's one of the possible answers. The first step could be that the farmer takes the sheep across the river. The fox and the lettuce can be left alone. The fox isn't going to eat the lettuce. So now the sheep's on the opposite riverbank. The farmer goes back in the boat alone. Now it doesn't matter which one it takes, the farmer can take the fox or the farmer can take the lettuce. Let's say the farmer takes the lettuce and the lettuce goes across. Now on the second riverbank, there's a sheep and a lettuce. We cannot leave them alone. So the farmer has to take the sheep back to the original bank of the river. And once the sheep is back, they're back there with the fox, can't leave them alone, they take the fox back. And so the fox and the lettuce both cross the river once. Once they're both across the river, they can be left alone again. It's the second time they're left alone. The, uh, not that the lettuce is gonna eat anybody, but the farmer goes back across the river and picks up the sheep a final time. The sheep travels across the river a second time, and now all four are across the river. So this required a variety of steps. It involved the sheep taking quite a few, it involved the sheep taking two trips across the river, and it revolved a lot of work on behalf of the farmer. But you can solve this problem. And if these are the types of problems that you enjoy, this means that your working memory is able to hold just a bit more in this cognitive load for you to handle this. Let's do another problem. This is a very famous task known as the pendulum task. This is commonly given to young adolescents and preteens. And in this task, you usually have a tall wooden structure that's T-shaped. And at the very center of the T is a little bolt where you can hang a string. And the participants are given three lengths of string, a long string, a medium string, and a short string. And they're given three weights, a heavy weight, a medium weight, and a light weight. And they are told that they can hook the weight onto one end of the string, hook the string onto the other end of the T-shaped wooden structure, and they have to try and make the, the weight on the string swing the farthest. So rather than having a very small pendulum swing in the middle, they want to try and obtain the widest pendulum swing possible. And there's three variables they can play with, the length of string, the weight, and also the height from which they let go of the string. Are they going to let go of the string at a, a smaller angle or a larger angle? And what is going to impact it? 
And so this is a very complex problem solving skill. So what the participants have to learn is that they have to try and hold in their memory which attempts they've tried and try to also cancel them out. This requires a lot of judgment, a lot of decision making, and it can be very onerous. Do you know the answer? Maybe you should try this at home and figure out the answer. Now another problem that I'd like to introduce to you is the Tower of Hanoi. This is a game that comes on a wooden board with three pegs. And the pegs stand upright and they're round. And around the center peg, there's usually four to eight discs. In this illustration below, I have four discs. And so they're just little round circular discs. And the goal of this is to move all the discs off the center peg and onto one of the peripheral pegs, but making sure that smaller discs go on larger discs. Larger discs never go on smaller discs, and you can only move one disc at a time. So in this illustration you see, obviously uh, this doesn't quite look realistic, but the red disc would have to move first, and it doesn't matter which side you put it on. Then the yellow disc would move first. Now you can't put the yellow disc on top of the red one, so you would have to move it onto the opposite. So if you can visualize this, you would have the red to one side, the green and blue in the middle, and the yellow to the other side. The next move cannot be to move the green disc. And that is because the green disc cannot go on top of the red and cannot go on top of the yellow. So you know your first move is to move the red. Your second move is to use the, move the yellow. Your third move in this game must be to put the red on top of the yellow again. This is going to be the river problem, but much more complex. You're going to have a series of redundant moves in order to not break the rules of the game. It is possible, uh, but as you add a disc, every fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth disc you add, it actually doubles the amount of moves it takes you to complete the game. So it's a really fun one, and I encourage you to try it out. There's lots of online apps you can use to play this game.